very much. Thanks very much. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today, and I want to tell you that the, I am so grateful and have always been grateful that the first job I got out of engineering school was at NASA. Now, everybody has to know that you go to engineering school to learn to be an engineer. You're not an engineer till you go out and you build some things that people you don't know use, and they use them in different ways you don't understand, and they that's when you become an engineer. And the difference of just going someplace and becoming an engineer and coming, going to NASA is that you do things that have never been done before. If it's been done before, we don't do it at NASA. It's really simple. It's like you can kind of count on that. And you do things that are daring. And you know, doing things that are new, different, move the ball down the field, as we like to say here, doing those things become a habit. And you have to be in a culture where daring to do new things that have never been done before is a habit. So I was really, really thrilled to work at NASA and to be in that culture and to learn to innovate things that have never been done before. Now, it's really interesting then as I go over to Tech Nation and I interview all these people and I, you know, all these years, it's just, it's been amazing. And while I'm talking to all kinds of people about the impact of technology, I've really been amazed that over the years, consistently, I've been asked a repeated question and it comes from the people who aren't technologists, aren't engineers, aren't scientists, aren't CEOs or innovators. It comes from a number of people who don't fall in those categories. And they're very concerned about the impact of technology. And they say, can't you people figure out the impact and when it's bad, like don't do it or change it? Can't you figure all out this out in advance? And I'd say, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I never could really explain why. And as I was thinking over the years, I finally came up with something I call the innovation cascade. And so the first thing you have to understand is that this starts when there's a new innovation. And so the first thing is innovation. Well, clearly if an engineer builds a tool or a scientist gets a new idea or anybody in gets a new idea, if it's new, it's in, you start the information cascade. Ca info in innovation casca uh, cascade, excuse me. Um, and, but you also get it when somebody takes an existing tool or an existing idea and then uses it in a whole new way. That too is innovation. So it's like, whoa, wait a minute. That's exactly why the creators of a technology can never predict how it would be used. You know, the, the whoever came up with that first hammer could not envision this building being built. Doug Engelbart, who, who created the first mouse, could certainly not understand what every computer in the world that uses a pointing device is creating. So what we're looking at is innovation starts, the innovation cascade starts whenever there's something new, whether it's literally building a tool or using it or a new idea or anything new in a whole different way. And then we get to whenever you create something new, individuals start to use it. And that's where ethics comes in. Now, sometimes it appears it doesn't because you say, well, I'm just going to, I'm not really thinking about it. Well, that is your ethic. I'm not thinking about it. You're giving it to me or I built it and I'll just use it over here. But there's a whole lot of people who say, do I want to use it or not? We certainly see it in the innovation area in uh, pharmaceuticals or medical or biotech because you're at the end of your rope. You have nothing. You have no options. And they say, well, we have this, but we've never tried it on a human. And you go, my ethics tells me bring it here, I'm willing to try it, even if nobody else wants me to. So we're talking about a whole lot of ethical decisions every time somebody creates something new. The next thing that happens is that when people start to all start to do it in general, then we start to have a societal reaction to it. What does society say about it? Now everybody here knows you don't pick up your smartphone in the middle of the sermon on Sunday and start glancing through your email. This would like not be good. You know, this is a social contract that we have. All of those things that we decide when it's appropriate and inappropriate to use technology, who should and should not use technology, all of those things socially happen. And from out of that experience then, we have laws. So the laws are of two types. The first one is, this is really bad, so we're going to make a law that nobody does this. And the other type is, oh, this is so good, everybody's got to have it. We've got to make sure they're there. And 
this is a short talk, but I can give you example after example. There are one or the other, and there's no laws in the middle. There's no laws that say, let's keep doing what we're doing. Does, that doesn't happen. So I was thinking, what does this look like in reality? Okay, so if we start with all the innovations, how many innovations do we have? Well, first of all, we have technology produced by engineers and scientists. You know, they, they need each other, and that's what moves technology forward. And I like to quote Peter Schwartz, because he's the president of the Global Business Network, and he likes to say, 92% of all the scientists who have ever lived are alive today. And 85% of all the engineers who have ever lived are alive today. So golly, what do you think's gonna happen? You know, we're gonna have a whole lot of technology. But it doesn't stop there. The next number is seven billion. Basically, we got seven billion people on the planet who can pick up a piece of technology, all of this new technology, and they can think of a new way to use it. So we're talking about the potential uh, area for all of this innovation to go on. So in reality, then your ethics area is this big. Actually, when I first did it, it didn't even fit in the PowerPoint slide. It was just <laughs> some little, then okay, well, so, the, so the, the wave there is actually bigger than it appears. So uh, of all of the, uh, it wouldn't fit in this room, as we used to say. And uh, so then we're sitting there saying, okay, well then, what does the, the next part say? You know, what about society? Well, a whole lot of people in society, we really aren't thinking about the impact or the ethics, but a lot of people do. So I said, well, I'll give it about the same thing as the innovators, people who come up with new ideas. And then, of course, we get laws. Yeah, do you see it? That actually I had to make bigger than it was. It's, we don't have that many laws. So when people look at you and you're just having something new and you're getting all excited and they say, well, it's not illegal, think of this slide. <laughs> well, almost everything we do is on this slide and it's out of proportion to how we think about it. But this is exactly what we have to understand when we're talking about the impact of technology. So I submit to you that now that we know this, and we want, if we want to dare greatly and do some really original innovation, we have to take this into consideration. We cannot ignore this innovation cascade. What do you know? What, when did you know it, and what did you do when you found out? Now, let me give you an example. Uh, years ago, I had a great panel on Tech Nation, and it was all about space. And I had Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon. I had General Chuck Horner, and Chuck was in charge of all of space, U.S. Space Command. I had Skip Johnson, uh, who was head of the White House Office of Science and Technology. And I also had the first woman head of a NASA center, Kennedy Space Center, Dr. Carolyn Huntoon. Well, the first three guys, Skip, Buzz, and, and uh, Dick, or Chuck, or what, I don't know, they're all astronaut kind of names, you know? <laughs> and they were like, okay, great, it's just going to take us, we'll do it in five years, we'll do it in three, no, we might have to do it in eight, you know, we'll get you up there, we'll spin around and come back down and you'll take your cell phone with you. You know, it's like, eh, it was like, going. and then I said, well, Carolyn, what do you think? Now, Carolyn was also the first life scientist not an engineer, first life scientist to head up Kennedy Space Center. And Ka Carolyn sat there and very quietly started to list the things that we did to the Apollo astronauts physiologically, permanently, by putting that bucket of bolts together and shipping them off to the moon and having them come back. And, you know, with this, Buzz is just going, maybe I should have not sign that waiver, you know, <laughs> not, it's not looking good. He's looking worse and worse and worse. And, uh, but it was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And she said, the earliest we could get there was 20 years. Now that we know what we do to people if we do it that way. I'm like, oh, that kind of puts a, that was, he's, uh, we said buzz kill, but buzz said buzz lives, buzz lives. <laughs> um, so, but the question is, is this means is like, you know, well, what stops us from daring? We can't let this drive the bus. We just have to make sure this is on the bus. Because we didn't know about this before. We didn't think about this before, but a whole bunch of us weren't really daring. So I sit there and I look at all the innovation that could happen, and, they, and I think, gee, I'm sitting in the middle of Silicon Valley, and we're just, you know, what are we doing here? And, you know, what stops people from daring? And I think mostly it's deciding to dare. You have to say, I'm going to actually do something. 
Not in Me Too, not in Elsa Rand, not I'm just going to work today. I'm going to actually do something that's never been done before, and that is daring. And so I sit around and I look at what stops people, and I think the number one thing is fear of failure. They don't want to fail. They don't want anybody to know they're failing. Well, let me tell you, in Silicon Valley, we eat failure for breakfast. We drink it, we swim in it, we throw it at each other. We actually don't trust somebody who has had no failures. It's like, what aren't they telling you? Life is full of failures. But what it is, it's a culture of successful failures. What is a successful failure? It's something that you look back at what you did. You accurately remember what you don't start blaming it on this or that. You accurately remember what happened. And as time goes by, you say, oh, now that I see this, does this apply? Or maybe something new is here. We don't even trust success. We say, okay, what was it I didn't know that happened to go my way and I should know now? So it's this whole culture of failure. And we always say, you got to own your failures, own your mistakes, or your mistakes will own you. Now let me give you an example of, of something like that and uh, in terms of daring. And uh, I was, because uh, you've got to make decisions. You've just got to make decisions. So a friend of mine was getting married in uh, Monterey, and I was living in San Francisco, and my boyfriend and I get in my little yellow sports car, and it's a Sunday morning, and it's pretty, and we're driving down, and our, we got our jeans on, but our nice clothes are up on the ledge in the back, and we get just outside of Monterey, and we realize it's the day that time changes. <laughs> We don't have an hour to stand around in the parking lot saying hi to everybody before we go into the church. It's almost time for the wedding. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? And we have to get changed for the wedding. Okay, what do we do? What do we do? And I said, wait a minute. You know, Dick lives right by Carmel Mission, which is where the, the wedding was. Why don't we pull into Dick's? Dick always leaves his door open. And we'll go in there, change, and we'll dash out to the wedding good idea. So we roll into the driveway, and of course, Dick's car isn't there because he's at the wedding. You know, so we get our stuff, and we go up to the front door, and we, and it's locked. We look at each other. It can't be locked. It hasn't been locked for 10 years. All of a sudden, he says, oh, Judy, Dick, and Judy, he's got a new girlfriend, Judy, and it's been getting pretty hot and heavy. Judy's talked some sense into him because we always said, Dick, you can't leave your door open. You just can't do this. It's like, what are we going to do? And I said, well, let's just go in the backyard here. And I said, there's, you know, there, we'll just go in the backyard, change our clothes really fast. And he goes, are you crazy? You know, he lives on this glen of like a dozen houses. And you can see trees, you can kind of see through. And these are right, you know, like, what are you thinking? I said, look, we'll go back. What, do you, what else are we going to do? We're going to go back there. We're going to take our clothes off. We're going to change. We're going to grab them. I said, they can call the police. We'll be out of here before the police come. And it'll be even a better story for Dick and Judy. It'll be great, you know. <laughs> and uh, he's like, oh, we got to do something. So let's do it. So we ran back there. We didn't look at each other. Like, psh, 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 psh. All done. And we run to the car. And we go. And sure enough, here's the bride, lovely bride, going down the aisle just in time. Phew. So afterwards, we're all standing. Everybody runs up to us saying, you made it, you made it. We were afraid you wouldn't make it. What happened, what happened? And up walks Ju Dick and Judy. And we said, well, we did make it. It's quite a story. And Dick and Judy are involved in the success. So we start to tell our story. And as we're telling our story, Dick and Judy get more and more alarmed. And they're looking at us. And finally, we said, what's wrong? And they said, we moved six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so I say to you, <laughs> you are going to make mistakes. <laughs> and you cannot say to yourself, I'm just going to sit in the middle of the envelope and just, you will not dare, you will not move things forward if you just do things that are safe. You've got to make decisions in time and you've got to decide what's wrong. You can't, and people will give you lessons that are ridiculous, like, well, that'll teach you to ever go to a wedding. It's like, no, that's not the lesson. And the lessons change over <laughs> lessons change over time, and you know, you've got to figure out what's going on. And, uh, and this culture of successful failure, we measure things differently. Not just did you come up with the big success and the IPO and the billions of dollars and sell it to Facebook or whatever it is. There is many, many things, to, uh, touchstones along the way. And I think the best one actually came, uh, just a, on a side note, from 
uh, the, the Gus, the, the soccer coach of my children's soccer team when they were playing soccer. And I remember all the little boys sitting there in their green and white uniforms, and they listen to Gus, and they're getting ready to go in the game. And here is Gus telling them, you got to get in there, and you got to do this. And every so often, he'd put his finger out, and he'd say, and remember, if you don't pull a foul every once in a while, you ain't playing hard enough. So one of the ways you know that you're doing it right and you're not just saying, well, I'm doing something daring. No, you're out there daring as you are trying. You're doing things that people haven't been done before. We don't know what the results are. We're going to try. If you don't every so often find yourself in a perfect stranger's backyard and in full view of all his neighbors stand there in your skivvies, <laughs> metaphorically speaking, of course, <laughs> then you're not playing hard enough. Thank you very much.